So thank you all for coming. Um, this is a talk entitled PostgreSQL as a Big Data Platform. Um, where I work at Adjust, we put a lot of data in Postgres. It's, a, um, it's one of the most scalable pieces of our infrastructure, and it's something we actually put a lot of trust into. So we'll be spending some time talking about what is big data and what is not big data, because there are a lot of um, uh, sort of misconceptions about what big data is and, and the sorts of problems um, that big data platforms are supposed to solve. So first, um, I want to kind of discuss the context of the data because data without context is just ones and zeros, right? Um, so the company I work for, Adjust, we do mobile advertising analytics and attribution. So basically, um, a lot of times people want advertisement on mobile devices that's paid for on a contract which says you get X amount of money for every user you bring us. Um, or you get X percentage of their purchases when you bring users to us. Now for that to work, you have to know that a user came in on a particular advertisement campaign. And you have to be able to do other analytics like revenue and so forth on a campaign by campaign level. So we gather all kinds of data that developers send us relating to their um, applications. And we track those uh, by the origin of the users on, on their um, applications. So uh, that's what we do. Um, and we focus primarily on trying to make sure that when an advertiser actually gets credit for something, that this, in fact, was some, uh, a user that they brought in not just um, you know, maybe spoofed SDK stuff or things like that, which happens way more often than I think uh, any of us would like. Um, so I had the uh, Postgres team at Adjust. We call it the database team. Um, we primarily are a research and development team. Uh, we don't typically act as first level on call at night. Um, so by the time Ops calls us, they've run out of ideas. Um, uh, we, prov we develop and uh, provide escalation support for database environments supporting uh, diverse products. These include analytics products and some other ones we'll talk about. And uh, our deployments um, are typically in the petabyte scale. So um, it's a lot of data that the team I, I run um, really does some incredible work on in these areas. and. Uh, uh, so let's talk about uh, why we use Postgres. In order to understand why we use Postgres, we kind of have to understand what big data is and what big data is not, and where kind of people run into, or where people run into a lot of problems, thinking that they're going to just throw big data solutions at something when, in fact, it often doesn't work. So. Big data is about V3 problems. Um, anybody here not familiar with the term V3? Okay, so V3 stands for uh, volume, velocity, and variety. So the idea of a big data shift is we're moving from sort of the kind of data that an accounting system runs where everything is defined structure, you have, um, you don't have a massive amount of it, maybe a few terabytes if you're a decently large company. Um, but uh, moving from that to a situation where you're trying to derive intelligence out of a wide variety of things, coming in at a high variety, at a high rate, possibly taking you know terabytes or petabytes of, of, <coughs> of space. Uh, big data is not a set of products. There's no such thing as a big data product. Okay. People will say, "What about Hadoop?" Hadoop is a tool which you can use for addressing some big data problems. It's not necessarily always the best solution for all problems, right? Big data is a set of techniques that we use to solve V3 problems, right? It's uh, a set of ideas and ways in which we can now manage data that may be spread upon, across many different servers in a way in which we can actually make sense out of it. It's not a set of technologies. You can take the same set of techniques and you can use a different set of technologies and it'll work. 
And most importantly, to make big data systems work, it requires a tremendous attention to detail. <coughs> and the reason is that typically, once you're dealing with velocity problems, you're putting stress on I.O. systems, you're putting stress on memory bandwidth, you're putting stress on the processors. And if you don't get those things right, the systems will fall over. So you can't just follow recipes. You have to actually pay attention to detail and you have to use techniques where they work. So having said all this, now you have certain um, uh, trade-offs that come from using something like Hadoop, which is uh, built around trying to solve certain big data problems versus applying some of those same techniques to Postgres. Um, the big one is that Hadoop thinks in terms <coughs> of sort of big blobs and um, large files. Well, Postgres thinks in terms of um, what we call a tuple or, or a database row. So if your data fits into database rows very nicely, um, applying those same techniques in Postgres can often be a lot more performant and a lot, more, um, a lot less of a headache than doing the same thing in Hadoop. So I want to kind of uh, go through a tour of the three main um, environments that we cover in this. First is our KPI service pipeline. Um, the deployment is, is probably at this point around a petabyte. Um, we deliver near real-time analytics on user behavior split up by advertising campaign. So you can find out um, you know, a particular campaign, how users are um, interacting with the application compared to those who came in organically. Um, and typically we have, you know, just a few minutes between when the request sits our back end service and when it's available on our KPI service or our dashboard. We have roughly 100 to 300,000 requests a second coming in through this pipeline. These are all independent HTTP requests, um, short payloads, uh, rapid processing, and uh, is delivered both by a dashboard and for external uh, API access. So the way we approach this, because as you can see, this is a significant volume and uh, velocity of data. But for the most part, the stuff we're interested in here is not, doesn't have a high variety. So we approach this as a data pipeline. Um, our points of access where the actual requests come into are highly redundant. Our goal here is to be able to survive a data center outage. So not just one server dying, but say power gets cut to a data center or the air conditioning goes off, which actually happened once. Um, we, uh, expect to be able to survive and at least continue core processing so that people's ads don't redirect to an empty space or um, you know um, and we can still ingest you know the data that, that we uh, that they expect us to ingest. Uh, the customer facing um, analytics charts are only modestly redundant they're paired with replication um, the idea is we can lose a single node and still serve requests. Um, but if the whole data center is down, the dashboard is not going to work. But we can send an email out to customers and we can say, hey, the dashboard is down, but we're still processing advertisements. But if we send them out an email which says we're not processing advertisements right now, please pause your advertising campaigns, they don't tend to be as happy with that. <laughs> Um, so our architecture is, on this one, um, so our, our basically we have uh, database systems where we have a program running that basically does all the digestion, it throws it into Redis, which we use as a queue, we pull out of Redis and put it into Postgres. Um, Redis, by the way, is a nice rate limiter, it uh, runs as a single threaded event loop, and so um, it only goes one speed. Um, then basically we map reduce this stuff into, into the customer facing systems, to the API, uh, the KPI service facing systems. And then we map reduce that again on query. So this allows us to take right now 45, uh, 50 um, point of entry servers and replicate that or digest that data into a set of uh, 
20 databases, each of which is much smaller. And for those of you who were here last year or uh, want to look at the talk, um, PostgreSQL 20 terabytes and beyond goes into that in significant detail. So on to our second one. This is we call Bagger. And that machine is um, Bagger, I think, 261 or something. It's the largest um, bucket excavator built. And that's the name of, that's where we named the tool. This was our Elasticsearch replacement because Elasticsearch for us fell over at a pedal. <laughs> we have um, up to a million, sometimes more, uh, data points a second that this ingests. It's just a debug. Very high volume. We're talking about 10 petabytes before duplication and compression. And um, basically, because this is a debug log, the information is extremely free-form. So we have massive variety, we have massive velocity, and we have massive volume. Yeah, but we only retain for a limited time, so you can basically think of the conveyor belt as dumping it off out of the system. Use cases, customer asks, why, do, why are my numbers like this? We can actually then pull a limited range of time of, of what actually hit our system. Our engineering approach was to optimize for bulk storage and linear writes. So everything's optimized for writing data as fast as we can. We Everything is stored as JSONB. Um, it's basically a stricter subset of JSON with um, a nice binary serialization. Do um, we don't support? Yes, duplicate keys. Oh, well, those are evil. <laughs> yes, but we don't support them in the part of the stuff. <laughs> um, uh, JSON, by the way, does support that. Um, data is partitioned by our service and tag, and then we drop uh, these partitions when the disk is getting full. Uh, client side sharding, so we actually query master servers as far as who has data we might be interested in, and we ask them. Um, it looks a lot like MongoDB sharding, except we did it with Postgres and we did it right. Um, um, for our architecture, data writes in Kafka and it's partitioned, uh, basically we use the Kafka partitions as partitions for the database. So right now, um, stuff comes in, um, basically you can think of it as one partition goes to one database. So you write to a topic, it comes out in partitions, you read from partitions. Um, data is partitioned in the database by query uh, pattern an hour. So um, as I said, service tag, uh, service tag an hour. Um, we track those on a sort of a metadata database. This is why I said it kind of looks like MongoDB because MongoDB has this concept when you do sharding. And um, we have a client written in Perl that basically queries the master database, sends the queries out to everything else, and then concatenates the data. Uh, one thing the Perl client does is it runs an explain first that will refuse to run this if it does a sequential scan. <laughs> On to the third. Um, audience Builder. Now, the purpose of Audience Builder is you want to run a retargeting campaign. You want to know which users of my application have spent 20 euros or more on this in the past, but have not logged in in the last two weeks. Because maybe they've dropped off and they're no longer playing this game anymore. We want the in-app purchases, right? So we want to hand a device list out to retargeting providers who can then display ads and try to bring these people back into the game. Now, right now, this is only 12 terabytes, OK? But this is effectively sort of a, um, uh, a service that we kind of only did a 1.0 version of. And now we're trying to support a lot of new features. And we expect those features to push things into the petabyte range. Um, also, this is not like a normal data warehousing environment, because in a data warehousing environment, typically you want to ask, like, for all users in Asia, what have my sales uh, figures look like per month, right? This would be more like, for, uh, 
for all users in Asia, which months have I had more than a certain amount of um, um, uh, you know, purchase volume? So a lot of your data warehousing solutions don't handle this query um, pattern very much. One thing about Audience Builder is compared to the others, I actually know something about the actual um, evaluation of other technologies. And we didn't just evaluate Postgres on our new version of this. We looked at Apache Drill. We looked at a bunch of other um, sort of big data frameworks along the way. And we ended up coming back to Postgres. So with the, with the, with the new engineering effort we're, we're pushing forward, um, we're actually continuing to use Postgres as the main query engine. So our engineering approach of the, of the new version is a separation of storage and query. The reason for this is we want to be able to scale up storage um, independently from scaling up query power. This is not a typical use case of Postgres, but it is something that in this particular case we kind of need. Uh, we settled on Parquet as a storage format. Anybody here familiar with Parquet? Okay. So Parquet is a columnar format. It's usually used in Spark environments and Hadoop environments and things like that. Um, typically, people who run this on Hadoop, they use this on Hadoop, they run MapReduce jobs that pull data back, and then on those they do further processing. So the Parquet format has a um, sort of a, the row group information on the last block of the file. So if we tried to access this over HDFS, that would be a problem. So um, I'll talk a little bit uh, in, in a few minutes about what we did specifically to, uh, to address that. Um, but as we, as we evaluated these, we came to the conclusion that there were two things that we really needed. And that was extensibility, so that we could do development in the database and support new things if we needed to and predictability of query performance. And so when we looked at Apache Drill, those were the two things we couldn't really make work. When we looked at ClickHouse, the fact that it wasn't extensible for in our purposes basically killed the idea for us. Um, so we put the Parquet files on Ceph. Reason for Ceph, Ceph has seek support. So we can just look at the last block and then figure out which pieces of the file we have to ask our network file. SQL basically acts as a query engine, and uh, we write a we write the files through a pipeline that gets data from uh, Kafka, and writes Parquet files, and then registers them effectively in the Postgres um, system using the foreign server foreign uh, table framework. We wrote a Parquet foreign data wrapper for Postgres. Um, if you search for it on GitHub, you will find it. Um, and with tuning for our use case, we got this as fast as Postgres on a native uh, file system local storage. What do we give up? We give up writes. So all the data is now um, non-writable from inside Postgres. But from a query engine, this works very well. And you can see the, uh, the um, URL there for the Parquet Foreign Data Rate. So, um, so those are the three environments, and you'll see that they're all very different, right? We have one that's sort of a, um, more like a standard data warehousing environment, but very high velocity. We have one that's you know, very unstructured data, um, <coughs> rapidly coming in, high volumes, but limited retention. And then we have another one that has well, it's relatively well-defined data if there's not a variety problem, but um, as we go into this, we're going to have volume and uh, velocity problems. Um, so here, the, the key takeaways here is that all these systems are different. You get into a um, big data in, um, scale, and your problems are very unique to the systems you're working on, right? So 
big data is entirely about technique. It's not about technology. And you can take technologies that were designed for smaller data environments, and you can apply the same techniques and get very good results in the big data environment. Careful attention to requirements and detail is extremely important, and every system is different. So just as a note, we use a lot of open source software. We prefer open source software because when it breaks, we can fix it. And at our scale, that matters. You know, we have, our VP of engineering has contributed fixes to Postgres, but we can't fix proprietary software we use. So we, uh, we definitely prefer open source. So thank you for your time. I think I might have a little bit of time for questions. Okay, so we looked at a few of them on the audience builder side. Um, okay, so, our, so for our initial analytics side, we looked at Mongo a long time ago and concluded it wouldn't scale to our needs. Um, on the uh, audience builder side, we looked at Apache Drill with Parquet files. We looked at Greenplum. Um, we looked at a few others. Um, the big problem we had with Greenplum is that it's really, uh, I don't think there's an easy way of adding new shards and dynamically resharding. Um, so, and we couldn't get drill to uh, behave predictably for us. Uh, you mentioned Ceph, I guess. Can you use any other like, storage solution? Uh, so on Bagger, we do local storage, hard disk, and ZFS. Um, the other systems are all pretty, um, pretty uh, basic file systems on local storage. Um, we do use NVMe quite a lot. Uh, 